Welcome everyone. I'm Susan with the Hawaii State Public Library System and we're so glad you've joined us for our program tonight on Pono Fishing. This program is part of our statewide summer reading program and we're celebrating the theme, Tales and Tales. We are highlighting animals of the land and sea and through this talk on Pono Fishing, we hope everyone can learn more about how we can be better stewards of our oceans and wildlife. Tonight, we conclude our month-long virtual series with the island of Oahu. Joining us are two specialists from the Department of Land and Natural Resources. Jason Mellinger is with the Division of Aquatic Resources and Kyla Herman is from the Protected Species Program. Jason has spent the last 15 years studying and working in the marine science and fisheries management field here in Hawaii. He has a passion for Hawaii's tradition, culture, and unique natural resources. Kyla was born and raised on the east side of Oahu. Growing up on the water has led her to pursue educational and community-minded positions on whale watching vessels, the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology, and now with the DAR Protected Species Program. Please feel free to ask questions and type your questions in the Q&A box and we'll share them with our speakers. So we will start now with Jason and follow with Kyla. Hi, Jason. Thanks for joining us. Hello. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for that great introduction. I really appreciate it. I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen so that I can get us right into it so we don't waste any time here. So let me just do this. All right. So thank you uh, again for having us. Thanks to the public libraries for hosting this awesome opportunity. You know, here at DAR, we always really appreciate any chance we get a new venue or a new space to talk to the communities that we work for. So I'm the education specialist here on Oahu for the Division of Aquatic Resources. And today for my short little presentation, uh, while I have you guys here, we're going to talk a little bit about Pono fishing, like we have for this theme with the whole month, but we're going to talk about how that applies to Oahu and how that applies to some of the ways that DAR is currently managing our aquatic resources. So just to start off, I always like to get people familiar with who DLNR is and who DAR is. So I'll go ahead and let me just click through here. DLNR, the Department of Land and Natural Resources. So DLNR and DAR, they're both part of the state government, but the Department of Land and Natural Resources is the big, big department that DAR is part of. So as we get into DAR, the vision of aquatic resources, we see that that's actually just a branch of the DLNR. So a lot of people when they see us on the water might say, hey, you know, I saw some some buoys out there that were floating that were marking the channel and they might be uh, mis mismarked. Well, that's something that division of boating handles. So one of the ways I like to think of what our division is responsible for is we are responsible for all of the living organisms inside of our aquatic ecosystems here in Hawaii. So all of the fish, the corals, the oopu in our freshwater streams, all of those living organisms is where we come in and manage. So just to give you guys a little bit more background about who DAR is and what we do, the big things I want you to read on this slide is just the manage, conserve, and restore. Our job is to manage, conserve, and restore our state's aquatic resources. And those can be in the salt water. Of course, we have our ocean aquatic resources. We have freshwater aquatic resources, many streams, rivers, even lakes here in Hawaii. We also have estuaries. I want to make sure everybody remembers the word estuary. This is one of the most productive ecosystems in Hawaii. This is the safe spot for all of our juvenile fish, also where the most food can be found for a lot of young fish. So our estuaries are very important. That's where our streams are meeting the ocean. And then, of course, we even have public fishing areas like Lake Wilson and the Wahiwa Reservoir. So that also falls under DAR jurisdiction, DAR management. 
And then since we're a state agency, I always want to remind everybody, young and old, the state doesn't end at Kauai. We have the entire, entire Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, which includes a lot of our state, which DAR does have responsibilities over too. So when we're talking about protecting our aquatic resources, it's not just the coral reef. It's not just the ocean. It's literally all of these aquatic ecosystems in Hawaii and all of the organisms that live within each of them. So hopefully that gives you guys a better idea of the scope of what DAR's work is statewide. And then just for those of you that like to read a little bit more, I have this extra wordy slide, which talks about some of our major program areas and some of the major focuses we have. But that's for another day, so I'm not gonna leave this slide on too long. Here's what we're here to talk about today, fishing Pono. So, there's lots of ways to verbalize fishing pono. Recently, I was working with um, the Malama Pupukea Waimea Foundation. So some of you might know that area is Sharks Cove. And they do a lot of work encouraging pono fishing practices as well. And they recently shared with me a quote from Uncle Mac Poi Poi from Molokai, who I think is one of the people who gets quoted the most when it comes to pono fishing practices. And I really liked what they shared. You know, they said that Uncle Mac said that pono fishing is knowing how something's going to be replaced before you take it out of the environment. And I think that has a lot of pieces to it, but if you have that skill set or that practice in the way you fish, you're going to be definitely doing some Pono practices on your way there. So some of the things that we can see on this list are, you know, things that we should all grow up knowing, you know, take only what you need, take the right size, not too big, not too small, you know, learn how to tell when fish are spawning, learn about the types of fish that you might be catching so you know what you're fishing for and how you might want to go fishing for it. So kind of upping your, let's say, marine literacy, your ocean literacy, your ability to walk through the ocean environment the same way we can walk through a forest and identify, you know, the different trees or what's healthy and what's unhealthy. All of that goes into Pono fishing. And I believe Adam in our first week uh, from Maui shared this, you know, that Pono fishing is a lot more than just what you're doing while you're fishing. It's how you're living your lifestyle, knowing that so many things you do affect the natural resources here in Hawaii, specifically our nearshore resources, you know, our coral reefs, the fish that live there, which are one of our number one resources for our survival here in Hawaii. And we, of course, know that by all the success that different populations had coming here to the most isolated island chain in the world. But here we are now, generations and generations later, with a big job on our hand of maintaining those resources so that we can continue to enjoy them for generations to come. So grab a couple of points from this slide, think about it for the rest of the presentation, and we're going to come back to this a little bit later, and we'll see how some of these iFish Pono practices apply to our modern day regulations. And so one thing before I guess we get into regulations that I want to do really quick is I always think it's important for us to understand our nearshore environment and what we're actually trying to protect and the environment that a lot of these organisms live in. So Adam went through it very quickly in his Maui presentation. I'm going to do it just like he did very quickly. So when we're talking about our nearshore environment, most of the time we're talking about coral reefs. Those are those productive environments where we see lots of fish, lots of diversity, lots of food resources. When we think about a coral reef, it's important for us to understand what makes them healthy? If we want to be Pono fishers, we need to make sure that the environment we're fishing in stays healthy and that the environment that these fish or organisms that we're looking to feed ourselves with are living in, you know, the best possible uh, space they can. So when it comes to corals and coral reefs, we know that they need clean and clear water because these corals are actually getting sunlight to grow. They need to have that translucent water for sun to pass through. They also need grazing by fish and invertebrates. So all these fish you guys see in the picture, they're all eating something. And if they were eating coral, well, there wouldn't be a lot of coral left in this picture. 
what most of them are eating is a lot of them are going to be eating crabs, little tiny snails, things like that, but also algae, keeping the reef clean from algae overgrowing this coral. Just to give you guys some perspective, coral here in Hawaii grows at about two centimeters per year. So if you put your fist up to your eye and close it tight and then slowly open it till you see light come through, that little bit you opened right there, that's about two centimeters. That's how big a coral the size of your fist is naturally going to grow in a year. Algae doubles its size in a week. So if I have 10 pounds on this reef, it's 20 pounds next week, unless we have all that grazing by these fish and invertebrates. So now we see really simply two of the biggest requirements for a healthy reef. So if I wanna be a Pono fisher and I wanna make sure that my reef that I fish on is clean or healthy, maybe these are a couple of things that I wanna look for or maybe help restore if that's not the case. What happens if we don't have that clean, healthy water or we don't have those herbivores? Well, I'll show you guys right now. This slide is one that always catches people's attention. So if you're sleeping, you're eating dinner, pay attention. This slide will definitely wake you up a little bit. So this is a healthy coral reef. We see lots of fish that would be grazing on all the algae in the background and then a healthy reef below. Now let's see what happens when we lose that reef health. This could be due to, let's say a sewage spill. This could be due to some sort of fishing issue where all the fish were removed from the area and the reef could no longer sustain itself could be from runoff from the shoreline whatever it is if the coral starts dying this is what we're left with and anywhere in the world wherever you guys are if you hear about oh we're you know trying to save the reef what are you saving it from saving it from turning into an algae dominated environment like this this is great for maybe oeo which is a good bone fit or good fish to eat great for sea urchins and a few other fish but you can tell that this is obviously not the same type of environment that leads to all those great resources that we think of when we think of a healthy, productive, food-filled nearshore environment. And so now that we understand our coral reef, let's just look at history a little bit. Originally, when Polynesians came here to the Hawaiian Islands, we see the Ahupua'a system, which is using the natural flow of water down the mountains, through waterfalls and streams, through the low E's, the water is returned from the low E back into the stream, and then it makes its way into the estuary and the ocean. And you see that the people living here had to figure out a way to not only allow this water to still flow and be healthy, but to utilize it and live off of it. So let's fast forward to modern day. All of those blue lines are streams. And we can see this is actually kind of the Hawaii Kai area just outside of Diamond Head and um, uh, Mauna Lua Bay. And what we can see here is look at the amounts of city or the amount of roads and pavement and homes that our streams are now going through. It's a big difference from the way that we started. So now our responsibilities are that much greater to make sure that the coast is still productive and able to provide even for just a few of these people, even if not all of them are eating, the are eating the food from the ocean, we need to ensure that they have the ability to gain food and gain positive, healthy resources from the shoreline. Once again, looking at Pearl Harbor, we see all of these blue streams that are now going through cities into Pearl Harbor, then finally out towards Eva Beach. So we can think about how much more impacts are running into our shorelines, how many more pollutants are coming into that fish environment. So that's why we have such a big job today. And Pono fishing has really become a lot more about not just how you go out and fish, what gear you're using, what type of knowledge you put towards your fishing, but also how you're living your life every single day outside of your fishing practices. And this little tragedy of the commons cartoon is just to tell anybody who's not up to date on their latest uh, fisheries terminology, this is kind of the issue that happens in the world when you don't have any management. If nobody practiced Pono fishing um, skills on their own or had the wherewithal to think maybe I shouldn't take some fish or I should have some process to how I gather, if we didn't have any rules, what we would see is this tragedy of the commons. Or you see one group saying water belongs to anyone, I take as much as I want. And somebody who's living off the same resources, but maybe on the other side of the island, 
is all of a sudden suffering because of somebody maybe overzealously taking or taking without thinking about those Pono practices. How is this going to be restored before I take it? In this scenario, they're not thinking how they're gonna restore the water before it gets taken. So that leads us to modern day management. So Pono fishing skills are the beliefs and practices we bring out there, but inevitably in order to get people to do the right thing, sometimes we have to have rules, regulations, and of course consequences. So typically most people know DAR from signs like this. We manage a lot of our fishing areas throughout the state. There's different types of fishing areas. We'll get into that in just a second. But these rules and regulations are, you know, let's say the scientific way of managing an area. However, what we end up finding out as we look deeper into a lot of our basic regulations, most of them are just Pono fishing practices with some numbers alongside of them. So let's go into that. When we look at our management techniques, we have different areas that are closed and open during certain times of year. Why? Well, because sometimes we want to, let's say, protect an area so that there's spillover. So all the babies that are being born in that area, like Sharks Cove, are spilling out onto the other beaches of the North Shore. Same with Hanama Bay. And we also have things like size and season limits, which we'll get into in just a second. So with our size limits, it's pretty simple. You know, why not take a baby fish? Well, if we're thinking just in terms of Pono practices, understanding the environment, understanding that small fish need to grow in order to reproduce, boom, I don't even need to look at the regulations. I know out of my Pono practices that I should at least know about what size do these fish get? What size is a good eating size for this fish? How small is too small? And you can learn that by talking to experts around you, by talking to people who have fished there before, but that's part of Pono fishing. And that should be just part of everybody's everyday practice before you even get the rule book. But when you do get the rule book, we have lots of great ways to enhance your ability to do that by measuring fish for certain lengths that we've figured out based on science to be a good length to catch that fish at. Now, what I'll say, if you're a Pono fisherman, you're not gonna catch the fish that's just barely legal because that means science has just barely said that that fish has been able to reproduce. You're probably gonna wanna catch one that's a little bit bigger because you're going to make those better decisions constantly. Now, we know that these regulations extend to all sorts of different types of species, not just fish, not just crabs, but even some of our eaten shellfish as well, like opihi. And when we look at size limits, we can see right here, like I mentioned, most size limits are to help protect growing and multiplying populations. This little cartoon helps us think about that, you know, before there were minimum size limits, we're going to throw back our small fish to grow, to get bigger. But also, one of the things we can do to be a Pono fisher, understanding the environment, is that maybe we want to have a maximum size limit in our personal, uh, let's say, practices when we catch a fish. That means that I know as a marine biologist, and I'm sharing this with all of you guys, so you all know it now too, and you have no excuse to not, not understand this later. But as fish get larger and they're able to reproduce more often, the babies that they have survive more frequently. The number of eggs they have is much greater than the number of eggs they had the first time they had babies. So allowing large fish to go back and reproduce is a great way to keep an environment healthy. So that's why in some states like Alaska, you see maximum size limits. They call those slot limits. But once again, in Pono practices, just understanding the way that fish dynamics work, maybe that's something you want to tell yourself. Hey, when I go fish, I'm not out here trophy fishing. Maybe if I do catch a big one, I'll take a picture and throw it back. But I know that catching that big one is removing something pretty important from this environment. And I also like to say, you know, if you're thinking of your environment and your fishing area like a farm, think about it like that. Maybe you don't want to take your biggest buck out of the fields because he's the one who's really helping the population go or protecting um, more individuals. So, we get into seasons, you can see really simply that we have different seasons for different species as well. These are the common rules and regulations. Seasons, they're set up to protect fish and invertebrates during spawning seasons. So one of the things that I think that we can add to our Pono practices, once again, to kind of just be a Pono fisher without even having to refer to the rules, is understanding the fish you catch 
learning when those fish are reproducing. Now, there are very few fish that you can figure out if they have eggs inside of them or if they're reproductive without cutting them open. But that gives you at least the reason to, when you catch a fish, think about what am I going to look for while I'm cleaning this fish? Maybe I'll look for the gonads to see if it was in season or wasn't in season. And that will affect if I choose to catch this next time I go out or during this time of year. Also, maybe you wanna check out the stomach content, see what that fish is eating. Maybe it's eating something that is really tasty that you never knew was on the reef and now you can start hunting for it yourself. Maybe the fish is eating something kind of gross that you might think twice about eating that fish again. So having that extra skill set built into your practices is really what we're getting at today. Then of course, bag limits. Well, why have a bag limit? Well, Bag limits protect species by limiting take in order to, present, to prevent overzealous fishers. So like that tragedy of the commons I showed you, if there are people out there fishing without Pono practices in mind, without thinking about all the other people that this natural resource is supporting, then we will have people who inevitably are taking more than they should or taking fish when they shouldn't in an unsustainable way. So bag limits are something that we may have rules and regulations for, but once again, as you build your own practices as a fisher, are you going to be the fisher who's more interested in taking a photo with 60 fish behind you? Or are you a fisher who's more interested in making that conscious decision saying, I could have caught 60 fish today, but I only chose to get 20 because I want to come back here and fish at this site in the next few months and not have to wait a year for it to replenish. So once again, treating your site like a farmer treating your practice like a farmer. You're taking things from the environment, but it doesn't come without understanding how it's going to be replaced and even why and when you're taking it. Then of course, gear. So I, I put together this list and I thought there's one thing that is unanimous with all of these uh, examples, explosives, electro fishing, firearms, chemicals, poisons, plant-based poisons, and even spearing for crustaceans like lobsters in salt water. So why are all of these things prohibited? Well, the answer is these are all indiscriminate ways for fishing, similar to a lot of, uh, you know, like let's say sand net fishing where they surround fish with the net um, for commercial fishing. We don't do that in Hawaii, luckily, um, that sand netting. But these fish fishing methods, which are indiscriminate, they don't let you see the fish you're going to hunt or take before you actually take it. Electro fishing is putting these electric uh, diodes in the water, which run current through the water and the fish come up to the surface. You scoop them up with a net, spearing for crustaceans. If you need to be able to check the crustacean to see if it's male or female before you take it, and that's actually a law, a rule and regulation is that they, you cannot take females. If you need to be able to check that, well, you can't spear it because by the time you speared it and pulled it out of the hole and looked at it, well, you've already made the decision to take that. And so one of the things that I wanted this slide to kind of represent is that indiscriminate fishing has the extra burden of responsibility. You know, we do have some types of net fishing here in Hawaii, but the rules and regulations say you have to go check your net very frequently, very often to make sure there aren't sharks stuck in it, seals stuck in it things like that. And so the rules reflect what should already be part of somebody's Pono practices. If I'm putting a net out there and I know it's indiscriminately fishing, I'm going to want to check that net often to make sure I'm not catching things I don't want to catch because taking them out of the water is harming the environment. All right. Then finally, our last little bit of Oahu here, we have all these different managed areas around the state. And these are areas that have special rules and regulations all set up to once again, help our aquatic environment. So as we go around the island, I wanted to use our MLCD Sharks Cove, which is a marine life conservation district as an example, once again, of, you know, here in Hawaii, we want to have our positive practices everywhere we go. But we do have some places with special rules. And it's important to kind of think about how those rules can fit into our practices. So we know that Sharks Cove, the Pupukea MLCD actually goes all the way from Waimea Bay, the far side by the islands over there, 
all the way to Kula Lua Point on the outside of Sharks Cove. So this huge area is protected in order to allow fish to spawn, to thrive, and to spread out across the North Shore. But there are also fishing methods allowed in this protected area. So we have no taking of marine life except two pounds of limu kohu and limu lipe'e pe'e by hand only. So once again, it's kind of ensuring that people are following those pono practices that have been determined to be good for that area. Two pounds of limu is a lot for any one person. Um, and, you know, if you were going out, let's say, to collect for a family, it's always per person per day for any of these rules and regulations. So if you had to go out for a party or something, just bring a couple extra people with you. Also, we have fishing from shore in Waimea Bay with no more than two poles. We have a lot of people out there. So one of the positive practices that had to be enforced by rules is just limiting the amount of rods and reels in the water so that people can mutually utilize and share the area. So as fishers, we have a responsibility not just to have positive practices, but also have a positive image out there to the public and other people utilizing aquatic resources. They belong to everybody. That's the tragedy of the commons. There's always gonna be that one person who's not following the rules. But if the rest of us are able to at least acknowledge, hey, we're all in this together, we all have a part in making this environment clean, healthy, and productive and fishable, then we have a really good opportunity to have a lot of great users like uh, swimmers and surfers and fishers all at the same site without complications. And then, of course, one of the big rules is you can actually net in Waimea Bay during specific times of year for specific types of fish. So once again, a lot of the rules and regulations we have here in Hawaii aren't just rules to protect the species from being overfished. They're really rules to help guide people along the lines of, hey, what are some of the best decisions you can make? And here are some of the decisions we've had to kind of make for the public based on what's happened in the past. So once again, getting back to our I fish Pono rules, you know, we saw you can take only what you need or you only want to take what you need by just thinking about, you know, who are we feeding? What are we thinking about when we're going out to the ocean? We know about size limits. We actually thought that we talked, we didn't talk about this, but knowing about male and female species, so don't take male blue parrotfish. It's because they actually, once a male dies, the biggest female has to turn into a male and that can take some time. So it will take a while before that population is reproducing again. If you're a farmer, maybe you can do that consciously knowing how long that process is gonna take to reproduce itself or replace itself. Once again, that Pono Fisher replacing what they are taking. But in general, just to add to positive practices, if you don't know, it's a great way to practice. One of the biggest things I wanna tell you guys too is to learn from others. Seek expert advice from people who have been fishing. Talk to other fishers. They want to set you up for success too. Nobody wants to see anybody out there struggling or not catching fish or not enjoying the sport. So please seek out all the resources you can. And with that, I'm going to share with you guys in my last few slides here, just some resources. So a big part of being a good fisher, a pono fisher is understanding your environment. Eyes of the Reef is a program together by the University of Hawaii and the Division of Aquatic Resources. And it's actually a training website where you can learn how to identify what's a healthy reef look like, what are invasive species I need to look out for here in Hawaii. And by adding that to your repertoire when you go out to the beach, you're going to know what fish you should expect to see. Is this beach I'm fishing at actually healthy? The water's clean, but the coral's all white. Maybe something's wrong here. So little things like that are going to help you a lot as you develop your skill set to being a Pono Fisher. Also, iNaturalist, one of the biggest things as fishers that's exciting is catching something you've never caught before. But we also want to know what it is, if we should keep it, making sure we throw back what we, what we need to and making sure we don't take things that are uh, regulated. So iNaturalist is a great app that you can download on your phone, take a picture of what you caught, and within 10 to 15 minutes, you'll get a crowdsourced response of what somebody may think that is. And then if a second person thinks it's the same thing, you'll get a confirmed response of, we know 100% that this is a barracuda or whatever you may have caught. So that's another great resource. Also, we talked about Pono practices outside of just your fishing practices. That goes for your boating practices too. We have a lot of boaters out there. And believe it or not, you can actually get your 
free boating license from boatus.org backslash Hawaii. So if you guys are out there looking for a job in marine sciences or working on a boat, go ahead and get this done over the weekend. You can add it to your resume right away. And it's a great way to kind of add to that. Once again, that knowledge base, that's going to make you that much more aware, active and thoughtful out in the ocean. One of my favorite websites, if you're out in the water looking at fish, looking at corals, looking at algae, and you want to know what's what, marinelifephotography.com has a gallery of everything you can find in the water in Hawaii. Kiyoki Stender is a marine scientist who lives locally and is a really great resource. So this is, you know, all of us scientists, if we're out diving, you see something you haven't seen, the first thing I'm doing is getting on marinelifephotography.com. So this will help you guys build up that dictionary or that glossary of all those fish you start to see in the ocean. So you'll know who are the usual suspects, who are the ones I'm looking for for food, who are the rare ones that I don't see often that I I maybe want to think about when and why I'm catching them or gathering them. And then finally, if you guys are out there and you see something that doesn't look right, you think somebody might be breaking one of the rules we do have set or doing something that just obviously isn't part of, you know, what you would consider pono fishing, you can always report that using our DLNR tip app, the tip 411 app, which can be found on all of your app stores. And my last thing, I always forgot I have this last thing. I want you guys all to know that in the future coming up, we're going to have a lot of meetings from DAR and a lot of opportunities for people to get involved in what it means to protect our aquatic environment in all forms, whether it's public outreach opportunities or new rules and regulations or protected spaces or just ensuring fishing opportunities are available in perpetuity. So keep your eyes and ears out for the Marine 30 by 30 initiative and opportunities to join us for public meetings. And with that, and these little links here, that's it for me. So thank you guys so much. And I hope you guys really enjoy Kyla's part of this presentation. We're going to get into some pono fishing around protected species. That's a tongue twister. <laughs> thank you so much, Jason. Before you go, we had two questions. Of course. One is, how can I get a rule book? All right. So rule books are in almost every single fishing shop around Oahu. That's actually one of my jobs. We've actually had so many people, whether it's locals or tourists, going to these shops, gathering the, the reg books, that it's been a little bit tough to keep up with the shops. So my job tomorrow, actually, is I'm doing an island-wide tour to drop off some more reg books. So if you've been to your local shop and you weren't able to pick one up yet, try any day after tomorrow and they should have a fresh stock. Excellent. I got one more question. Is fishing allowed in the Diamond Head and Waikiki area like by the natatorium? Wow. So that's a great question. So the natatorium actually has two separate protected areas right next to each other. One of which is a marine life conservation district, which is completely protected. No take at all. And that's going to be from behind the aquarium to pretty much behind the entire natatorium. But on the diamond head side of the natatorium, right at the end of the wall, is where the Diamond Head Waikiki Fisheries Managed Area begins. And so from that wall end, all the way around the corner over to the Diamond Head Lighthouse is open on even years only for fishing. And that's rod and reel fishing, spear fishing, what have you. So typically in that site, if you haven't seen anybody fishing there in a while, it's probably a year off. It's one of the odd years. And then January 1st of one of our even years, you'll see there will be tons of people ready to catch all the fish that got a year break. Thank you so much. I know we have a couple more questions, but I'd like to go to Kyla now and then we'll come back to your questions. So thank you so much. Kyla, we'd love to hear your portion now. Thank you, Jason. Of course. Thank you, guys. Hi. Uh, good evening, everybody, and I'd like to say thank you so much to Jason and the Hawaii State Libraries, as well as everybody who's presented over the past month. I think the whole team on both sides have done an excellent job, and if you were unable to catch uh, any of the other presentations, they are online and recorded, but I'm coming to you today um, from town, 
and we'll be talking today about the Protected Species Program. Like Jason, I'm with the Division of Aquatic Resources, and we'll be talking about pono fishing with protected species. So it's kind of how the web of everyone is connected in one way or another, whether you're at the top of the mountain or in the water, everything is connected with each species. And this will be the protected species staff. We are across the whole state. Uh, I'm here on Oahu, but we have Kehau for Maui Nui, CJ on Hawaii Island, Mimi on Kauai, and all of us are able to help uh, with any type of protected species outreach and education, questions, uh, emergencies, or anything like that. What our team does is we do outreach and education, such as uh, events like this, or we go into classrooms. We are team members with scientists, with UH Manoa, UH Hilo, with Cascadia Research Collective. We are a voice between the science side and the fishermen like you. So we're able to kind of collect from both sides and be communication. We have shoreline monitoring. So maybe you'll see us in a blue short shirt walking down the beach, give us uh, a tap on the shoulder or say hello. We're happy to give you any outreach material or let you know what we're doing. We're usually counting a monk seal, a turtle, finding marine debris, which uh, goes to our next one, marine debris removal and disease reduction. We can be found at educational booths at your favorite fishing store, at tournaments, uh, in classrooms. Uh, we were happy to come to any classrooms if you reach out to us. Uh, part of our job here on Oahu, uh, we go to harbors. And so that is the Waianae Boat Harbor right here with a bunch of outreach material. We're walking the docks. We're talking to fishermen like yourselves. Uh, we'll be talking today about false killer whales, the Hawaiian monk seal, sea turtles, oceanic white tip sharks, and the oceanic manta ray. All are protected. In the corner, this is one of our field survey days. Uh, I'll talk to people all the time who tell me that they see monk seals, and then I'll ask if they've called and reported it in, and they have no idea that that's a resource to them. So what you can call in a monk seal when seen, you can see say where you've seen that monk seal, what time you saw it, and then that way uh, they're able to send a volunteer to make sure that people are keeping their distance or just keeping track of that monk seal. We are able to help and assist with removing marine debris. And uh, something that surprises everyone is how heavy marine debris really can be when it washes up on a beach. It's no easy task. This is a uh, pile from Lani Loa up in Laie, and that's probably about 2000 pounds lifted through a team of many and dropped off. And this is actually in Kona because we're able uh, to work with other scientists like Robin Baird from the Cascadia Research Collective and do field work uh, across the state. Like uh, Jason said, fishing is more than sport. It's more, it's more than sport for everybody and it can be family's time. It could be sustaining our uh, family, our community. Uh, it's very important for us to kilo or for uh, to have observations. When uh, my mentor was teaching me, it takes you three years to know a place. And I really shrug, shrugged that off. I was like, I've been here my whole life. I, it doesn't take three years to be in one spot. But working in one spot every day for a minimum of three years and making those steady observations is all the difference in the world. So everything that Jason just mentioned is knowing your environment, knowing the weather, the animal, uh, the fish, female, male, size limits. It's so important to know the place that you're going to be if in the rules and regulations, whether that's an open or closed spot, uh, seeing the change. So if you're seeing a change for the positive, that's great. If you're seeing a change for the negative, you need to report it, report it to uh, the proper person who can come and take note or uh, fix the problem that's happening before it snowballs into a bigger problem. 
knowing the weather, the fish, knowing uh, the tide for that day or the wind or any type of weather is so important for your fishing activities because that that uh, can save a life. And just uh, seeing the natural impacts that you're doing. So you always want to make leave something better for the next generation your kids and your kids kids and it's so important because fishermen like you are the first on the scene 10 out of 10 times we're getting phone calls uh you're the eyes on the water saying there's marine debris on a coral reef there's a dead shark washed ashore there's someone uh, violating a rule. It's communication and open communication that uh, makes everything run smoothly. And so these are just uh, a couple of pictures of fishing <laughs> throughout the years. But each island has its own issues and threats for protected species. And I'll just go over some. Jason did a great job uh going through it so I'll touch lightly on it but runoff it can be terrible for our reefs and just the chain throughout and pesticides uh can seep through our soil systems and make its way back out to the ocean and marine debris and can just entangle many animals uh and be very a, a tough problem so it's always good to report a net that has been washed ashore, as well as Toxoplasma gondii, uh, which is uh, affecting monk seals and pregnant monk seals as well. And it's really just knowing that we can coexist through change. And this is a happy photo of fishermen's going off in the right direction. If you see a seal, don't be casting or throwing anything in their direction, just move on over and you guys can fish together. But now we'll be talking about the protected species under state jurisdiction. And this is uh, some pictures coming up, uh, maybe a bit graphic, so you can look away. Uh, but we will be going over the hawksbill, the manta ray, false killer whale, oceanic white tip, green sea turtle, and the monk seal. First, we'll start with our turtles. And uh, hawksbill turtles, uh, or honu ea, will be found more in Maui, but can be found here on Oahu. And you'll be able to identify them through this beak on its face and this scalloped shell. Whereas the green sea turtle has that more rounded face and a smoother shell. They have they're known for their fibropapillomas uh, or tumors on their face, which can be contagious within, with, between other turtles or in the entanglement of nets or eating plastic or fish hooks. And then also turtles, when they hatch, they're going towards the moonlight. And so if there's light pollution near a nest and they're hatching, they're gonna go towards the road rather than towards the ocean. And if you're driving on the beach, your uh, car not only could be squashing a nest, it could be compressing the sand. So if a nest did hatch, it's unable to make its way through the sand into the ocean. Uh, a huge misconception is you couldn't help. So it's important to know that you can help. It's okay to help if you see an entangled turtle, if you are capable, if you are able to assist and it, you feel safe doing it, you, you just need to uh, cut as much line as you can off or cut any line that is entangling the turtle. If you don't feel comfortable or you are unable to assist in a sea turtle, there's this phone number that you can call and someone when they are available will head out. And it's very important to be very detailed with your messages if you're leaving a voice message, when you saw it, where you saw it last, and uh, any type of landmarks are always extremely helpful for you to be as detailed as possible. We'll move on to monk seals. Monk seals are so unique and they're endemic to Hawaii and are 
there's um, a different amount on each island. And so you've been seeing a lot of them in media recently through people um, posting uh, maybe poor interactions with them. And so it's been really um, inspiring to see all the PSAs that have been brought from that, seeing all the people coming together and creating informational uh, or proper uh, how to be with seals, but also take everything that you see on the internet with a grain of salt. You don't want any misinformation to be spreading quickly. But monk seals can also be entangled with nets. They can get hooked by a, a ghost hook or anything floating and just rubbish or any other entanglement. And moving on to pelagic species, this uh, is a fun topic and for fishermen who are able to be going offshore, if you're a boater, uh, whether it be for recreation, commercial, sport, uh, even if you're not looking <laughs> for any of these animals, you might be able to encounter them more than scientists are able to see them because fishermen are on the water 365 24 seven. And so it's eyes on the water that's able to get more information for us so we can uh, learn more about them. Threats for fishing with false color whales, um, a, a hooking. Uh, the, false color whales are, um, we have a uh, endemic population, a genetically different population here in Hawaii. And uh, there are several things contributing to their decline. And that could be uh, or organic pollutants in their tissues. They're very slow to reproduce. Uh, the production of food available, uh, entanglements, and uh, sadly, people intentionally shooting a false killer whale, which you're, we're able to see there were some photographs of a bullet hole through a false killer whale. These would be some examples of, this would be a, a mouth hook uh, injury, a line injury, and a strike injury. Uh, this was a false killer whale that was found uh, on Maui, and it was not a hooking injury uh, that uh, was the end to this one, but they were able through a necropsy, which is an autopsy for animals, uh, find these hooks that were in its stomach. And this is just a, a quick outline of, there's three, when I'm talking to fishermen most, uh, they'll be so lucky to have seen a false killer whale. And they'll say that there's plenty. And uh, that may be just luck for, for some, but there are three populations here in Hawaii and there's the pelagic offshore, the, uh, the northern and the endangered main Hawaiian islands population doesn't ever leave more than 75 miles of our area. So this is a different population and they are found in just several pods throughout the state. So if you are able to snap a photo, it can also be just such a quick encounter, but whenever you encounter a false killer whale, it's great if you can call it in, make a report, all reports will remain anonymous. And if you can get a photo, it, their dorsal fin is as unique as a thumbprint. So it's great to have an above water photo of either side of the dorsal fin, and that'll get sent off for photo ID. Different things boaters can do uh, other than reporting a sighting. You can reel in your line when you do see a false killer whale and change locations, uh, send in photos, and then assist with marine debris removal when possible. We also uh, have oceanic white tipped sharks, which can be commonly misidentified. And as a brown shark offshore can be uh, tough. We have created uh, ID guides that you can contact us for, and we, we're happy to send out any type of ID guide for you. Uh, though it's easy to identify them through their white uh, markings on their dorsal and pectoral fins. 
They're found swimming between fads. And sometimes you'll see them with uh, pilot whales uh, swimming, trailing behind a pilot whale. If you see one, uh, it's great if you can report that in as well. Also listed is the oceanic manta ray and reef manta rays are also listed, but the oceanic manta ray is uh, very unique. It's found offshore. Sometimes you will find them sailing on in closer to the reef. And you can tell the difference between uh, an oceanic and a reef manta would be through this top marking. It'll be more of a T, whereas a T and the reef will have a Y, but also their basic size difference. A reef manta will be about uh, 14 feet max, where a oceanic manta ray can get up to be about 25 feet. And with them, uh, what can be um, a entanglement, just getting tangled up in a, one of those nets can really be tough for them to continue moving and that'll drag them down. So what can we do? What, what can we do? It's wait for an animal to move away when fishing, change your location, be line conscious because if you remove as much line as possible, that'll be less entanglement of an animal, reporting interactions or sightings, know your locations, boat slowly in near shore waters to prevent boat strikes or collisions, uh, know the laws and follow them and share your knowledge with others. Things like this, learning this evening from Jason and other presentations. It's things like this that are so um, amazing to be able to share with others when you see someone um, maybe doing something not quite right out, uh, in, out on the shore or out on the water. It's better to correct them in the moment than to have an accident happen and then have them have to learn from their mistakes. But uh, also fishing barbless, and a lot of you may know the barbless circle hook program, and that's just being able to smash that barb down, and that makes things uh, easier for catch and release, being able to get that hook out and toss the fish back, or for an animal to be able to shake off that hook. Unfortunately, the next slide will have a graphic image, just letting you know, but also a so for kids or us, we don't want to get hooked. So if it's barbless, it's much easier to remove and saves you a trip to the emergency room, hopefully. Saves a life for an animal. And we have um, a request for any of you holding a CML license or, or a commercial marine license, if you are reporting your catch. At the very end of the form, there is a, in the trip comment section, there is a voluntary box. And for the past year, a lot of fishermen have been great in filling in that box. Everything that you send in is completely anonymous. I, it goes to a third party and then sends to me. We're looking for any encounters or interactions or sightings of the false killer whale, uh, the oceanic white tip mantas, monk seals, you just put what you saw, where you saw it, your lat long maybe, and uh, that gets marked down and we're able to record that. I've had a lot of interesting sightings, a pod of sperm whales, uh, many sharks, uh, spear fishermen with their oceanic manta sightings. It's been great. So keep up the great work and send in uh, anything you can in the comment box. As always, it'll remain anonymous. I, I've, on the news, you may have seen recently, we have the new marine debris removal hotline, and that'll be 833-FORDANETS or 833-432-6387. And it's on Oahu, Maui, Kauai, and on Hawaii Island. And so if you see a heavy piece of net like this, call it in and we'll be able to focus or send your call to the proper team that'll send out trucks and shovels and knives and anything we can to remove and get that out of there off the shore. And so this was about 2000 pounds um, in, off uh, Lani Loa, I believe, or close, close to Laie. Uh, 
and it took half a day, but this, this was a successful phone call. And as a reminder to everybody, it, report what you see. That's a big help. It makes a big difference. Most of the people that I'm speaking with, they have stories. They've seen a false killer whale. They've seen an oceanic white tip, but they haven't reported it. And that's a big difference and it's a big help. And so uh, report any marine mammal or marine animal emergencies or encounters. And this will direct you to the right phone number through here, but we want photos, sightings, encounters, we're, we're ears, and we're happy to listen to anything you guys have to say. And I wanted to say thank you for sticking it out. I know it's late on a uh, Wednesday, but thank you so much for your time. And thank you so much for everybody who came out today. Thank you so much, Kyla. That was great. Um, we have a couple of questions. It could be for either Jason or you. Um, one question came in, can you fish near Shark's Cove? Take it away, Jason. <laughs> yeah, no problem. So Shark's Cove itself, um, the area by the reef and the tide pools, you cannot go fishing in. So you can only use those rod and reels at Waimea Bay on the far side of the MLCD. Now, I think very smart fishers are some of those who know that that closed area is filled with fish. So a lot of fish tend to go right outside the closed area and back in. So if you go to that point on the far, I'd say that I guess that's kind of the Eastern end of the Sharks Cove MLCD, right outside that point, as long as you're outside the barrier, uh, the marker for the MLCD, it's great for fishing. So that's where I'd recommend to head out there. Great. I have another question. This one is from Jason Corrales. What kind of bait should we use so turtles don't eat it? Hmm. Very, very great question. Well, turtles love to eat limu or seaweed. So if you do happen to have a turtle that does go after your hook, chances are you might have been fishing with some seaweed on your hook. But more often than not, sea turtles tend to get entangled in gear. So their fins will get wrapped up in it or they'll get a, a hook kind of into their shell. Um, and so typically, you know, you wouldn't catch a turtle using your average like fish baits. Um, they do sometimes eat squid, but once again, uh, more often than not, sea turtles aren't going to bite your hooks, but they're going to swim into them and kind of get tangled up in them. And once again, that's when it's one of those really important things to remember. You can always reel in that turtle remove as much gear as possible. And if the barb happens to be stuck in the top of the mouth, that's one of the only situations where I'd say, cut the hook as close to the barb as you can, you know, and get as much gear off as you can. Otherwise, almost every situation, you can pretty much remove all the gear from the turtles. That was great. Um, I wanna thank both of you, Jason and Kyla. The, the information you shared tonight was really great. Thank you so much. Everyone, we've come to the end of our program. And again, we'd like to give a big mahalo to Jason Mellinger and Kyla Herman for sharing great information that will help us all care and protect our oceans and wildlife. Our library system is so excited to partner with the Department of Land and Natural Resources this summer. If you missed any of our previous Pono Fishing virtual talks, visit our YouTube channel for the recordings. The web link is posted in the chat box. Thank you all for joining us and have a great evening. Mm -hmm.